is this night different from all others? Asks the voice of a child at the beginning of a Seder or Passover celebration. And in the cycle of questioning and answering that follows, the saving activity of the God of Israel in the Exodus story is recounted and is celebrated with symbolic foodstuffs, ritual drinking of wine, reclining and singing. It is a real celebration. In celebrating the Passover meal, those gathered recalled their liberation from slavery and their covenant with God. Historically, the Exodus event had taken place long ago, but for those gathered for Passover, there was a real understanding that the liberation experience of Exodus was present with them now, that the covenant was not only meant for their ancestors, but was theirs now that just as God had shown love and concern for the Israelites in bondage, that same love and concern was a present reality. It was in this context that Jesus, in the Synoptic Gospels, presiding at a Jewish meal and interpreting the elements of the meal, said something new. Take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. Do this in memory of me. Thereafter, our Christian forebears, seeing in Jesus' life, death and resurrection, a new covenant, a new liberation, gave thanks and praise to God with bread and wine as Jesus had done. They had the faith of a mystic kind, that in the words spoken by Jesus and in the sharing of the bread and wine, the saving love of Jesus was a present reality. In the first century, little attention was given to how the bread and wine became the body and blood of Christ, or when, during the liturgy, this change occurred. The emphasis was on Eucharistic action. The believers gathered, not in a place of worship, but in the intimacy of their own homes. Their celebration included spontaneous prayer, readings from the Hebrew Scriptures, the singing of Psalms, readings from the letters and Gospels that would one day form the Christian Scriptures. They recalled the words of Jesus at the Lord's Supper, and in the blessing, breaking, and sharing, and eating of the bread, in the pouring and drinking of the wine, they understood that Christ was present in the actions of their liturgy. Their faith in the real presence was based on the gospel promise that where two or more of you are gathered in my name, there am I in your midst. But something new began happening to Eucharistic theology as it drifted away from its Jewish roots. After the course of many centuries, there was a change in emphasis in the Eucharistic meal, where once the emphasis had been on the action of the Eucharist, by the Middle Ages the stress was on the elements of the Eucharist, the bread and wine. Christian scholars had discovered the works of the Greek philosophers. One of them, Heraclitus, said, The only constant is change. So the great philosophers, like Aristotle, were interested in how things change. How does an acorn become a tree? How does iron turn into rust? How does wood change into ash? How does water become vapour? And Christian scholars asked, how does the bread and wine change to become the body and blood of Christ? This emphasis on the elements caused great changes in Eucharistic liturgy. Active participation by the believers gave way to passive worship and adoration. Communal and spontaneous prayer gave way to formalised prayer in Latin, spoken by celibate male clergy only. Worship and fellowship around a table became worship in Gothic cathedrals with an altar distanced from the believers and an altar rail separating them. Bread became a host and came to be seen as an object of adoration and devotion. 
the reception of communion declined because people felt unworthy. The teaching of the church upholds transubstantiation as an acceptable term for what happens during Eucharist. Transubstantiation can be explained in this manner. The realities of bread and wine are changed into the realities of the body and blood of Christ while retaining the appearance of bread and wine. Catholic scholars derived this way of thinking from Aristotle, who described reality using such terms as substance and accidents. This allowed theologians to explain that the substance of the bread was changed into the body of Christ while the accident's appearance remains the same. But who today approaches communion with the mindset of an Aristotelian? Transubstantiation is a challenging dogma for the 21st century intellect and is a roadblock towards ecumenism. To my mind, transubstantiation is an attempt to explain the inexplicable. Can we not simply let the words of Jesus spoken in the Synoptic Gospels be what they are? Take and eat. This is my body. This is my blood. And allow the mystery to wash over us. Saint Augustine of Hippo said, We become what we receive. We are awakened to the love of Christ in our hearts. In John's Gospel, there is no institution of the Lord's Supper. There is no sharing of bread and wine. But there is some visceral imagery associated with communion in Christ. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life within you. The eating of Christ's flesh sounds somewhat cannibalistic, and the drinking of his blood sounds vampiric. But here is the point. If I were to rip a piece of meat off a leg of lamb with my teeth, chew it, mix it with my saliva, swallow it, and let the digestive system go to work, here is what happens. Two separate entities become one, inextricably bound, total communion. We are awakened to our communion in the love of Jesus, who in John's Gospel commands, love one another as I have loved you. And Paul reminds us that such love is eternal. Bread, I 
contemplate that the transformation that is occurring during Eucharist occurs within the hearts of the communicants themselves. It is an emphasis that sees Eucharist being more about us becoming the body of Christ than it is about the bread becoming the body of Christ. Moreover, is not our encounter with Christ experienced through the totality of the Mass? The informal gathering and embracing of our fellow believers as we enter the church. The music. The art. The readings and psalms. The words of Jesus in the Gospel. An uplifting, engaging, challenging homily the prayers of thanksgiving, the sign of peace, the Lord's Prayer, the sharing of a meal, the support of our needy, the final commissioning. Interestingly, the word religion means to bind. Eucharist reminds us that we are bound to God through Christ, and necessarily we are bound to each other through Christ. A priest theologian once said to his listeners that at Mass, when he elevates the communion host before the communicant, in his mind's eye he holds up with the host the whole assembled community as the body of Christ. And Jesuit mystic, Father Pierre Teilhard de Chardin goes one step further. He recalls that during the Great War, when he was conscripted to be a stretcher bearer for wounded soldiers on the Western Front, he had a profound experience. Early one morning, as the sun was rising over the battlefields, a serenity came over him, and he desired to say Mass there and then. But he didn't have the elements of bread and wine, so instead he consecrated the awakening world as his host. The very cosmos itself became for him the body of Christ. The depth, width and breadth of that which we hold to be Christ, who is all and in all, is that expansive. Our reception of the body and blood of Christ at Holy Communion allows us to contemplate that we are in communion with that driving divine energy of love that draws all things towards completion, an activity that has been ongoing since the beginning of time. There is a need also to appreciate that the celebration of Eucharist allows us collectively and as individuals to broadcast the cries of the human heart that all people have had at all times. There is the cry of the heart that yearns to give praise for all that is good and beautiful. The Oh My God prayer. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. There is the cry of the heart that yearns to express sorrow for one's failings and seeks forgiveness. The God forgive us prayer. Of God you take away the sins of the world grant us your peace. There is the cry of the heart that expresses joy and gratitude for the blessings in one's life. The thank God prayer.
there is the cry of the heart that desires release from pain and adversity, the God help us prayer. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. And there is the cry of the heart that simply asks, why? All these cries of the human heart find expression during Eucharist. And finally, our choice to celebrate Eucharist announces to the world our commitment to Christ. And it is no small commitment. The apostles at the Last Supper gave their lives to that commitment, as did many of our Christian forebears. And of course, our commitment to Christ is realised through our love and service to each other. The love we imitate is that of Jesus, whose life, death and resurrection were marked by love of a self-sacrificial kind. Our Christian forebears, with their Jewish sensibilities, recognised Jesus as the Lamb of God as the lamb in the Exodus story had its blood sprinkled on the wooden door lintels so that the Israelites might be saved, so is Christ's blood shed on the wood of the cross that we might know the saving power of God's love, even over death. It might be a stumbling block for the modern mind to appreciate the notion of a God as a father figure sending his son to die on a cross, and this verse of how great thou art may be troubling to the modern mind. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. But we remember the words of John in his first letter, who gives us a concise understanding of God in just three words. And so we understand that love placed Jesus on the cross. Love for the poor, the marginalised, for the victimised and exploited. And love forgives. That is the power of love, given from a place of powerlessness and total vulnerability. That is the self-sacrificial nature of Christ's love, and that is the love we are called to imitate when we are commissioned at the end of Mass. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. One in love, we go forth in the service of the Lord. One in love, one in love. To comfort and console, to nourish and restore. We go forth, we go forth, one in love. In our joy, we go forth as Christ Jesus in our world. In our joy, in our joy. Richness says the Lord. Now, one mission of love, one dream we share fullness of life for all. One in love, we go forth in the service of the Lord. One in love, one in love to comfort and console, to nourish and restore. We go forth. We go forth, one in love. We go forth, we go forth, one in love. 
There is a humorous scene in Monty Python's Life of Brian where Reg, the leader of the People's Front of Judea, seeks to overthrow the Roman imperial estate and asks the gathered members a mocking rhetorical question. What have the Romans ever done for us? But one by one, the members begin to nominate all the positive aspects of Roman rule. In the end, Reg has to qualify his question, asking instead, All right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, a fresh water system and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? And I sometimes think that a similar situation arises when those who only dwell on the scandals of the church ask, what has the Catholic Church ever done for us? It's easy to restate the scandals that have plagued the church throughout history. And most recently, the disheartening effects of the child sexual abuse scandal and its cover-up cannot be overstated. However, if we were able to click our fingers and magically erase the church's contribution to society, we would regret the loss. Christian charity has given us hospitals, health care for the poorest, universities, educational opportunities for those who would otherwise not receive them, care for the disabled, food programs, shelters for the homeless, protection for young girls from sexual predators, emergency relief programs, access to clean water, skills training for the unemployed, services for young mothers and their infants, refugee advocacy, support for those unable to make ends meet, advances in science, philosophy, the arts, and on and on and on. In a broader sense, Western society has benefited from Judeo-Christian contributions to social moral order based on respect and equality and justice for all. Our first century Christian church flourished. Despite adversity and persecution, its first adherents were society's most marginalised. So what was the appeal? One, they proclaimed the beliefs that promised hope and immortality for those whose lives were marked by sickness and poverty. Two, they came together as close, joyous communities to celebrate the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Three, they provided social security for each other based on Christian dignity and respect for the human person as modelled by Christ. Let's jump forward in our timeline of the Catholic Church to the year 1198 to the papacy of Pope Innocent III. Now the Church is the most powerful institution in Europe. The Pope is able to bend kings to his will. The Church of Innocent III was far removed from the poverty of the early church and far removed from the beatitudes expressed by Jesus. It was a church of wealth and pomp. Far from being persecuted, it was a church that persecuted. During the reign of Innocent, the Cathars of the Languedoc region of southern France were put to the sword. Men, women and children. They were considered heretics. As the towns in the region were being sacked, one commander was asked if he feared the innocent would be inadvertently killed along with the heretics. His reply was, Kill them all. God will know his own. Far from being a church of humility, it humiliated. It became self-assured and dogmatic regulating all aspects of life, censuring those who dissented. It was about this time that in a town in Umbria, in central Italy, a merchant named Pietro farewelled his wife as he began a journey to France. 
His purpose was to acquire bolts of cloth called silk. During his sojourn in France, his pregnant wife Pika gave birth to their son. In the absence of her husband, Pika had to name the child and christened him Giovanni, John. But on his return, Pietro objected to the name John, considering it too religious, not for his son, the life of a prelate. This child would not enter the service of the church, but follow in his father's footsteps to become a wealthy merchant. Pietro admired the French for their business acumen. Pica herself was from a noble family from the south of France. Pietro rechristened his son after the French. He called him Francesco, the Frenchman. The boy grew up to be fine-looking and outgoing. He was certainly well-dressed, wearing the finest fabric. He enjoyed a rather frivolous lifestyle of good times and parties. He had a talent for drinking and composing and singing songs. All of this made him a great social companion. Everything changed, however, when his hometown of Assisi went to war with neighbouring Perugia. Francis was captured in battle and spent a year in a prison dungeon awaiting his release. Conditions for Francis while he was in prison were appalling. The darkness, the solitude, the cold and disease. He became ill, probably with malaria. When his release was arranged, his appreciation for clean air, the colours of the day, and the simple pleasures of clean water, firelight and sunshine brought a new awareness to his soul. He visited a church that was in disrepair and fixated his attention on an image of the crucified Jesus. In the intensity of his concentration, he heard the words, Rebuild my church. Taking the directive literally, he stole his father's cloth to purchase stones and bricks for the repair of the church. But in time, he realised his mission was to rebuild the integrity of Christ's church. In telling his father he was going to devote his life to Christ, his father became confrontational and locked him up. But his mother obtained the keys and set him free. On departing the family home, his father insisted that Francis not take with him anything that had been purchased with his father's wealth. Francis stripped himself naked and walked free in all senses of that word. He chose to be a poor mendicant friar in a simple hooded cloth garment, a rope for his belt, and he wore no shoes. He shaved the top of his head and observed Christ's commitment to the poor and the sick and the imprisoned. He preached the gospel to simple folk. He tended to the needs of lepers, and he celebrated God's good creation with songs of praise. Glory and praise belong to you, my Lord, all oh, glory belongs to you. For our brother the sun Who brings us the day and the night Praised be my Lord For our sister the moon And the stars so precious and bright Glory and praise belong to you My Lord, all glory belongs to you For the goodness of fire Whose warmth and whose light is ever near
Praised be my Lord for the goodness of water, so precious, humble and clear. Glory and praise belong to you, my Lord, for glory belongs to you. Praise be to you, my Lord, for all your creatures, all honor, all blessings to you. Praised be my Lord, for our brother the wind, every breath, every breath that we draw. Praised be my Lord, for our mother the earth, the flowers and the fruit she brings forth. Glory and praise belong to you, my Lord, all glory belongs to you. Praise be to you, my Lord, for all your creatures, all honor, all blessings to you. Blessed are those who in service of the Lord are clothed in the garb of humility. Blessed are those who enjoy in peace, they will find their rest in God. Glory and praise belong to you, my Lord, all glory belongs to you. All glory belongs Francis lived the simplicity of the early church, believing, celebrating, serving. Like Don Quixote and Jesus, he was considered a mad eccentric, but his charisma was such that he attracted thousands to his simple lifestyle. The contrast with the Church of Innocent III could not have been more marked. The church would continue on its march towards the scandalous papacies of the Renaissance, the selling of indulgences, and the great historical reaction to a corrupt church, the Reformation. In 2013, a cardinal, newly elected to the papacy, did something very brave. He chose a papal name that no other elected pope had dared to choose. Francesco, Francis. Unlike his papal predecessor, Francis declined to wear a gold and jeweled and crusted mitre or ermine trimmed cape or elevate himself on a magnificent throne. This new pope embodied the simplicity, humility and poverty of his namesake. In his first address to the world, when he accepted the papacy, he, he said, I am a sinner. With his emphasis on mercy over dogma, his insistence on a church with the smell of the sheep, proclaiming a gospel of joy, his fierce commitment to protecting the earth, his exhortations to build bridges and welcome refugees, his expressed desire for our church to be a learning church, less judgmental, encountering people where they are. His real efforts to engage with other faiths and his priority for ecumenism bring hope of church renewal, resurrection, a church that embraces the Beatitudes. Pope Francis numbers among the poor our own planet. He has written an encyclical, Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home, addressed not just to the church but to the world as an urgent plea to take action against rampant consumerism, exploitation of the earth and global warming. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis says, The universe unfolds in God. God's love is the moving force in all created things. 
the entire universe speaks of God's love, God's boundless affection for us. Other creatures reveal God, a mountain, a desert, a tree. Each is a manifestation of God. To touch soil, water, mountains, is to feel the caress of God. There is a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf. Nature is filled with words of love, but do we listen? Or are we overcome with self-absorption? We are part of the sublime communion of creation. The universe is not a stage we act upon and leave. We are intrinsically a part of it. We are linked by unseen bonds. We are a part of a universal family. God has joined us so closely to the world around us that we feel the pain when a part of the world is disfigured. We should feel the pain of deforestation. The planet Earth is one of our poor. We need a change of heart. It is time for conversion, a change in lifestyle. Find the capacity to be happy with little. Return to simplicity. This is Barry. Barry lives simply. He is 93 years old. In his prime, he installed curtains. He also played saxophone and clarinet in a band. <laughs> Barry grows tomatoes at the back of his home. He attends Mass every Sunday. He helps to give out communion and reads from the lectionary. He recites his creed. He sells the Catholic Weekly newspaper after Mass. He speaks fondly of his wife and always speaks positively of others. He admits to being impatient at times, but he is indeed a most beloved member of our church community. He visits those of our parish who are sick or live in nursing homes. He has been a volunteer for the St. Vincent de Paul Society for over 56 years. He visits the battlers of our local community, distributing food vouchers to those who have been unable to make ends meet. He is moved to tears when he meets those who are in such financial hardship they choose to live in their cars. He provides the vouchers that will help them pay their electricity bills, and he generally takes an interest in their lives, inquiring about their families and their health. And whenever he leaves their homes, he always turns to them and says, God bless you. Barry is a believing, celebrating, serving Christian. There are many like him in our parish. They are models of authentic church. God bless them. God bless Barry. And God bless you. Go out to the world. Go out to the world, go out to the world and proclaim the good news. And know that I am with you, yes, until the end of time. As you go out to the world and proclaim the good news. As you go out to the world and proclaim the good news. As the Father sent me, go out to the world. So am I sending you Go out to the world With the peace that I leave you Go out to the world With the joy of the gospel in your heart Go out to the world Go out to the world Go out to the world And proclaim the good news And know that I am with you Yes, until the end of as you go out to the world and proclaim the good news As you go out to the world and proclaim the good news You are the salt of the earth Go out to the world A light unto the nations Go out to the world A 
city on a hill. Go out to the world. Let the light of your goodness ever shine. Go out to the world.